We are in a series that we are calling Collaborate, where we are talking about how does the body of Christ, the church, collaborate together in order to express the person, the presence, the ministry of Jesus in the world around us. And the last few weeks, T.D. has been bringing us through Ephesians chapter 4 as kind of a blueprint for the church, helping us look at these five functions that are needed for the church to express the fullness of Jesus in the world. And in order to fulfill these five functions, we've said that God has given each of us gifts in certain areas so that together, as we collaborate together, we express the fullness of Jesus in the world. Now, I know for some of you, this is maybe a new paradigm to think about these five functions as being kind of definitive of the, the life of Jesus and the calling on the church. And so I want to just kind of give you one illustration that has kind of helped me wrap my head around all of this. And it goes back to my days uh, back in Chicago when I was in grad school and I was a high school basketball coach. And every year at tryouts with this high school basketball team, I knew that when I threw out the 30 guys onto this court, that what I was looking for was a team that could fulfill the five functions needed for success. I knew that uh, as a team, we needed to be able to possess the basketball, to, to handle the ball well, to, to push the tempo at times. I knew that our team would need to be able to distribute the ball around and make sure it touches everyone's hands and we get a lot of movement to confuse the defense. So I knew that there was a ball handling function that I had to find somewhere in this tryout. I knew that we had to shoot the ball with accuracy. In the, in the new game of basketball, the three-pointer is so important. I knew I needed people who could stand on the outside and make those shots and be trusted, especially late in the game. I knew that in order to balance the outside shot, I needed people who could cut to the basket, kind of that slasher type who could get to the rim and, and draw contact. I knew I needed someone who could rebound the ball, a big presence inside who could keep others away, get the ball, put it back up, kick it back out. And then finally, I knew that on the other side of the ball, defensively, I needed someone who could guard the rim so that when their team tried to cut to the basket, they were intimidated that there was a big presence inside. So I kind of had these five functions in mind, and, and I knew that the, the dream would be that all five players that I put on the court would be able to do all five things equally well, that they would be great at all five functions. But the reality is that's just not how it works with athletes and with a team. And so what you end up doing in tryouts is you look for people who have a natural gifting in one or two of those functions. You look for someone who, based on the, their size gift or their speed gift or their intelligence gift uh, or kind of the practice that they've put in with their ball handling, you look for someone who can fulfill that function. So you try to find a point guard who can be the primary ball handler and fulfill the ball handling function. You look for a shooting guard who will be the primary shooter. You look for that three man who can cut and slash, whose gifting will allow you to accomplish that function. You look for the power four, the, the big man inside who can rebound, and then finally that center who can protect the rim. And, and then every day in practice, even though you have individuals with the gifting who are good at that function, my job is to try to improve the intelligence of my team in every area. So you're actually working with the center and teaching them how to pass and maybe handle the ball when needed. You're, you're working with a point guard and saying, hey, you might get wide open for a, a shot and you're going to need to hit that shot. You can't just say, sorry, coach, I do one thing and I do it well. No, no, we're all growing in all five functions. But at the same time, we recognize that each of us has a natural gifting in one or two of the functions that allows us to do that better than others. And so what you do is you put together a team that can collaborate well, that can work as one, a unified, mature group of people that celebrate the diversity of their gifts and celebrate that together we can fulfill all five of those functions. Now, it's not really that unlike the church. Jesus has given each of us gifts, supernatural gifts that are expressed in our life that allow us to, to be better at expressing some of these functions in the life of the church than others, and yet we're all called to grow in all five of these functions. But when you put us all together, the goal is that we would each kind of cover for each other's weaknesses, learn from each other's strengths, and together we would become a, more, a better expression of Jesus in the world. The calling upon the body of Christ is to represent the fullness of Jesus Christ. In the same way that Jesus came and represented who God was, he's now sent the body, the church, to represent who Jesus was. 
And so in order to do that, we, we continue to express all of the fullness of who Jesus is. I mean, often we think about the, the character of Jesus as one of the things that we're trying to express. So maybe think of that as like fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. That's the character of Jesus. And we hope that the world looks at us and sees characteristics of Jesus that point to Jesus. But there's another part of Jesus' life that's not just his character, it's the competencies of Jesus. It's the, the skills, the activities, the things that he did. And that's what these five functions are. They're really the practices or the, the activities of Jesus that add value to the world. And so we are not only living out the characteristics of Jesus, love, joy, peace, patience, we're living out these functions of Jesus, the apostolic function, the prophetic function, the evangelistic function, the shepherding function, the teaching function. And as we do that, we are representing Jesus in the world around us. All five of these have been given to the church and all five of them are needed in every local church in order to bring about the fullness of Jesus in the world. These gifts are for equipping the church. They're literally the equipment the church needs to express the fullness of Christ. We can't do it without this equipment, so we have to receive it, understand it, wear it well, and as we express these equipping gifts, we express the fullness of Jesus. And so that's what this series is all about. It's about learning how these functions are expressed in the church, better understanding our own giftings, so that we can help Media City embody the fullness of Jesus, not just with each other, but also in the world around us. And so most of the, the slides today, you don't have to put anything up there now, but in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a little QR code, and you can scan that QR code and take uh, an assessment that the team has put together called a GPS assessment that will help you understand your sense of gifting. Am I a point guard? Am I a, am I a big man? Am I a center? Where do I fit? And then how do I model that in a way that inspires others to grow in that gift as well. So today what we want to do to kind of continue to grow in our understanding of these five gifts and functions is to see how they're expressed in the life of Jesus. Because Jesus is the perfect embodiment of these five gifts. And he becomes this model for holistic ministry that we can learn from. Jesus is the ultimate apostle, the ultimate prophet, the ultimate evangelist, the ultimate shepherd, and the ultimate teacher. He's the ultimate model for us. Think about the, the different ways in which Jesus lives out these functions, right? Teachers, they're called to keep us biblically grounded. The teaching gift is about wisdom and, and knowledge. It helps keep a church rooted over the long term. Rather than drifting off into some newfangled theology, there's a historicity and a rootedness that brings us back to God's word that helps us have a, a multi-generational legacy and impact as truths are passed on from generation to generation. Well, look at Jesus. He was literally called rabbi, teacher, he was a guide to his disciples. He brought people around him and he, he expounded and infused them with spiritual truth. He opened their eyes to new realities. He used teaching tools like parables and illustrations. And even in the Last Supper, when he institutes the liturgy of communion, that's meant to be a, a teachable, a tangible reminder that every time you do this, you are to remember what it was like to learn from me, to experience me. He says he is the word, the divine logos, the, the actual essence of God's communication in human form. He is the truth of God made flesh. Jesus is an ultimate, he's the ultimate teacher. Now think about the shepherding function. Shepherds care for the health of a community. Shepherds nurture and support. They, they promote unity. They're caregivers. They, they reconcile parts of the body that have become separated from each other they're like the glue that holds the family together well Jesus did that he, he radiated concern for people he tried to create communities wherever he went he was caring for individuals and caring for family relationships his his healings and miracles demonstrated God's love and mercy for people he made them feel seen and loved and known through his interactions he reconciles people back into a right relationship with their creator through his death and resurrection. When he encounters people, he meets them where they are. He heals the sick. He meets two sisters who are who grieving the loss of their 
brother Lazarus and he cries with them like a, a shepherd would. Jesus is the ultimate shepherd. And then there's evangelistic function. The evangelists live on the edges. They are inspired to invite others into the community. They want to expand the circle. They, they love recruiting people to the cause and telling the good news of God's grace in, in compelling, compassionate ways that lead others to action. Oh well, my goodness, look at the ministry of Jesus. He says, I came to seek and save the lost. He tells parable after parable about how he goes after those that are lost, tries to bring them back, and then celebrates that they've been found. He proclaims the good news of the kingdom of God, both in word and in deed. He reaches out to those who are on the margins of society. He tries to center children and women and, and the sick and, and even people from other cultures. He tries to bring them into the circle and make sure everyone knows that they have value as well. Jesus is the ultimate evangelist. Prophets are wired and attuned to God and God's will. They're sensitive to God's spirit and leading. They're willing to bring correction like we see the prophets in the Old Testament do. They try to keep the body aligned with God. They often look like challengers and reformers and truth tellers. They're willing to take a stand against injustice even if they have to pay a personal price. And then we see Jesus come and he steps into the world to try to break the power of human sin and, and stand up against the demonic evil influences of the world that he's encountering. He calls people to obey God's will. He calls them to higher understandings of obedience even. He says, you have heard it said, Moses said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that even if you look on someone lustfully in your heart, you've committed adultery. He's raising the bar of morality in a way that prophets often do. He sees the injustice of the Pharisees and the way they're oppressing people and, and making them twice as fit for hell as they were before. And he starts pointing a finger to the point where he says, you brood of vipers, what are you doing? He stands against injustice and then in his own life he's modeling true righteousness through acts of mercy. And like many prophets, his prophetic stance will ultimately get him killed. Jesus is the ultimate prophet. And then finally, the apostles. Apostles are sent ones. It literally is a, an emissary or an ambassador who's sent out on a mission to represent someone else, often like a, a, an emissary of a king. And so the apostle goes out and they pioneer, they extend, they take new ground. They recruit and release others into the movement so that the entire movement extends and expands and takes new ground. Well, we see Jesus coming into the world as an agent of God's mission. Just as the Father has sent the Son, Jesus says, I now send you. He recruits others into the mission and sends them out so they will become apostles as well. He extends the boundaries of God's kingdom, going around proclaiming that kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is not just an eternal place you go to when you die, it's breaking in right now. There is a, a movement of men and women that he releases and sends out after the resurrection as an extension of everything he has done. Jesus is the ultimate apostle. But yet here's the thing about that list, and I don't know if this is true in your experience, but... As I think about who Jesus is and the ways that Jesus has been portrayed over the course of my lifetime, and I grew up in a local church before wandering away for a while and then coming back, and I've had exposure in a lot of different churches, the primary ways in which I hear Jesus depicted and see Jesus depicted are really primarily around the idea of Jesus as shepherd and Jesus as teacher. Right? I mean, even if you walk through uh, the Louvre or, or, or you know, Renaissance art, uh, or you maybe Google up images of Jesus. You see pictures at your grandmother's house of Jesus on the wall, right? I mean, often you think of, who do, who, what does Jesus look like? Well, I think of like Jesus with the sheep around his neck. You seen that Jesus, you know? Shepherd Jesus got the little sheep. Or maybe uh, Jesus is holding a child or, or healing someone. We get a lot of shepherd Jesus, compassionate, tender Jesus. And then we see Jesus as the grand orator teaching. Maybe he's, you know, on a field with thousands in front of him. Or maybe you've seen him on the boat teaching up onto the shore. Maybe you see his 12 disciples around him. Or often there are pictures of like little children around him. He looks like a Sunday school teacher. You know, he's sitting down. He's instructing them. We get a lot of teacher Jesus. Sometimes we get evangelist Jesus where you can tell that what he's doing is, is sharing the gospel in a way that's going to bring someone in. But you know, you don't get a lot of like prophetic Jesus. 
You don't actually get a lot of apostolic Jesus. The prophetic Jesus is the one that kind of bugs me because I feel like I, I know there are stories where Jesus was a, a prophet. So it's like this week I got online. I'm like, where are the pictures of prophet Jesus? If I can't find them, maybe I can make one. So, you know, I got on an AI image generator and I said, hey, let's get prophet Jesus. Let's see Jesus flipping over the table in the temple courts. That's the ultimate prophetic move. Bam, there he is. I mean, even AI doesn't know how to do prophet Jesus. That's not what he was doing. Come on. I don't even want to know what apostolic Jesus is going to look like. But I say all that to just make the point that part of our understanding of Jesus needs to be this full understanding of Jesus fulfilling all the functions. Because if not, if we only view Jesus through the lens of three gifts, then we will only live out those three gifts. And so if Jesus is represented in all five of these functions, then for us to be a whole body, we need to do that as well. So what I wanted to do is take one story that I hope is very familiar to us and, and look at it through the lens of these five strengths. So it's the encounter with the woman at the well. Let's view John 4 through the framework of these five gifts. And if you have a Bible and want to read along or use your phone, you can. We'll be in John 4. But before, let me just remind us of kind of who the woman is that Jesus is going to meet. Jesus is walking through the area of Samaria, and he's going to meet a Samaritan woman at midday. And as you're maybe familiar, the reason she's there, we assume, at noon rather than early in the morning is because she's trying to avoid all the other women who would have gone first thing in the morning to draw water while it was still cool. And so we assume that she's some level of social outcast, and eventually we'll learn that it's due to her relational history, and the text will tell us that she's been married five times. Now, I believe, and I've read this from many scholars, that I think this speaks to a fact in her life that is not clearly or pointed to, but is based on ancient Near East culture, which is that I think that the reason she's married five times is because she's unable to have children. In an honor-shame culture, people don't get divorced for irreconcilable differences like they do in the West today. Women had no power to divorce a husband. A woman would get divorced because a man divorced her because she could not provide culturally the primary function of being a wife which is to give a man children so five different times she's married men hoping believing trusting that she could get pregnant and give this man a child and five different times the man has said you're broken enough of you I will find another woman in fact the man she's living with now won't even honor her with a formal marriage because he doesn't think that she'll be able to do that so her physical brokenness has led to this social brokenness where in the eyes of her community, she's probably seen as cursed by the gods. Like, you're so broken, we don't even want to be around you, lest the curse on you rubs off on us. And she is aware of this kind of social um, sidelining to the point where she decides, I'll just go get well. I'll go get water at the well in the middle of the day so I don't have to deal with the comments and the snickers and the snide remarks from the ladies who know that I'm broken. So Jesus' mission when he encounters this woman is to seek the redemption and renewal of all creation. And so you begin to imagine what would the redemption and renewal of her life look like. It wouldn't just be going to heaven when you die. It would be that the kingdom of God is going to break into her everyday, current, present life and that everything might be different because of her encounter with Jesus. That she might be restored back into loving relationships. That she might feel loved and seen by God and loved and seen by others around her. It's not just going to look like forgiveness from sin. I'm sure there was sin in her life, even if it had nothing to do with her marriage. We're all sinners. But it would look more like being restored from this place of shame to a place of honor in her community. Being centered again. Being able to fit in and belong in the world that she lives in. Jesus is out not just to save her soul, but to transform this woman's whole life. But to do that, it's going to take all five functions to bring her out that level of fullness. So let's see how he uses the five gifts and how he exercises these five ministries in her life. And we'll walk through John chapter 4, and I'll begin in verse 3. First thing we see is that Jesus' apostolic ministry gift is at work. So Jesus left Judea and went back once more to Galilee... Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. 
when a Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? The apostolic gift is about movement. It's about being sent out. It's about breaking new ground as an agent for change. It says here in the passage that Jesus was going from Judea, the, ra- the, the realm of the region of the south, uh, to Galilee, the region of the north, region of the north. And it says, so he had to pass through Samaria, which was the region in between. Except if you've ever looked at a, a map in your Bible, you'll notice that the Jews actually didn't go through Samaria because they deemed those people to be unclean. And so they, had crossed, they would cross over and go their, through their own land and then cut back over. Almost the, the way a, a 405 or a 495 or a 295 highway goes around the city because nobody wants to have to go through downtown at this time of day. And so when it says that he had to go through Samaria, this is not a geographical mandate. Like, oh, had to go there, chilling away. It's, it's actually an apostolic mandate. It's a missional mandate. It's a, I have to go to this region to engage with these people because I was sent to everyone. The Jews would not cross this barrier, but Jesus, as an apostolic person, is like, I have to cross over. My impulse is to go engage in different places, difficult places. It's to, to pioneer, to extend the kingdom of God, to take on new territory, so to speak. Just that he was sent to earth as a missionary to display the nature of God, he now feels sent into Samaria to display the presence of the Messiah. But not only is he breaking, again, this kind of geographical and cultural barrier, but he's also breaking the social conventions when he strikes up a conversation with a woman while they're alone. That often wouldn't happen. And not only that, but the woman pretty quickly realizes, I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew, why are you talking to me? We have nothing in common, meaning I know you all look down on us. I know you think nothing of us, why would you ever want to talk to me? But he's not only talking to her, he's actually doing something even more apostolic, more boundary crossing. He asks her for a drink, meaning I don't have any cups or anything to draw water from, but whatever you have, would you let me share that cup, that pitcher, that jug Would you share it with me that we could both drink from that same cup? That is culture crossing right there. That I am a Jew and willing to share the same implement that you are sharing. Now what she would know is you do know that will defile you, right? Like that will make you unkosher, unclean. I can't believe you would do that. He is crossing over, stepping over every cultural convention To the point that when the disciples get back, at the end of the text, you know, they're like, what is he doing? (laughs) Why is he talking to her? Why does he sharing a drink? They're like, they're blown away. They're too embarrassed to ask the questions out loud, but it says in there, like, all the things that they're thinking. They're like, Jesus, no one goes here. No one does this. No one talks to people like this. They definitely don't drink with people like this. What is going on? And Jesus is like, whoa, apostles do. This is exactly what apostles do. Apostles are sent to cross over. They feel compelled to, like it's part of their DNA. Like the minute you draw the line, they're like, well, I got to cross that now, I guess. I mean, the minute you say that the kingdom of God can't go there, that that person will never be reached, that the gospel, that Jesus is not working, the Holy Spirit isn't present, they go, that's it, I guess I'm going, because I I don't believe that. And so Jesus is like, man, I'm breaking that mold. I have to do that or else I'm not being who I was called to do. Second thing you see in this text is that Jesus' evangelistic ministry gift is at work. Verse 7, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus asked her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Evangelists are friendly to the fringes of society. They love reaching out to a woman like this who's seen as an outsider and trying to center her and make a personal connection, make her, see, make her feel valued and seen. And notice how he's inviting friendship through the sharing of this cup of water together, even by putting her in the power position to say, would you 
basically serve me with the resource that you have. I think in our Western culture today, sometimes we think about, you know, like a, a waiter or a waitress at a restaurant and often the person who has the money is in the power position and they're paying the person to serve them. But in that culture, the point here Jesus is making is that you have the resource that I need. You are in the power position. Basically, would you give me a drink of water? And you could say no. Because, and then I would be stuck. He's actually leading with, with a sense of weakness, not strength. He's not demanding. He's not saying, I can make water out of thin air if I want to. Would you like some of my water? He's basically saying, you have something that I need. And he's inverting their entire social and, and, and kind of cultural dynamic in that moment in order to create a sense of friendship. And then he does what every gifted evangelist does. He takes a very natural conversation about water and he turns it into a spiritual one. It's not some heavy-handed, if you died tonight, why would, should I let you into my kingdom? It's just, you know, hey, you got water. Water makes me think of thirst. Thirst makes me think of kind of, you know, what else are we thirsty for? And actually, if you wanted to ask me, I could give you something that would solve all the thirst, all the longings in your life. Is that interesting? To share the good news with a woman at the well, you just start by talking about water. You lead with humility. You ask for a drink. You establish rapport. The evangelistic gift is not a bullhorn or a sign on the corner. It's not condemning people to eternal damnation if they don't turn or burn. No, no, no. It's about a winsome personality that invites others into a conversation, invites them into a community, and then once that trust is established, communicates the gospel in a way that resonates with the longings of their own heart. And what a gifted evangelist. It leads her to respond, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. The third thing we see is that Jesus' prophetic ministry gift is at work in verse 16. He tells her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. I think the first couple of times I read this, I read it through the lens of kind of Western condemnation, almost like, like he was trying to trap her, you know, bring your husband. Oh, I don't have a husband. Ha ha, I know you don't have a husband. You have five, you know? Yeah, what's wrong with you, you know? I don't think that's at all what's happening. I think what he's trying to do is he's, he's, he's exercising the prophetic function, which is that the Holy Spirit in Jesus that came upon him on the baptism is giving him a word of knowledge for this woman. He's giving him a specific insight that he has, would not know naturally. He's never met her before. He doesn't know this from a natural point of view. He doesn't have a, a dossier or a scouting report. But the Holy Spirit reveals to him something about this woman that he wants to reveal to her as a way of showing her I see you and God sees you. And not only do I see you, but I know something about you that has caused everyone else to condemn you and yet I'm not condemning you. So you don't have to hide from me. In fact, let me just state what I know is probably the biggest source of shame in your life and then let me not treat you like everyone else has treated you. I mean, the Spirit reveals something that only God could reveal. And that insight communicates to her that this God that she wonders about is active and alive and he's here. He's not just in Jerusalem. He's not just where the Jews live. That there is a supernatural God who knows things, who is speaking right here, right now in her presence. In fact, her response just goes to show she knows what's going on. She goes, you are a prophet. You should know that. God has told you something. This is what a prophet does. He gets a special insight from God and reveals it. And the beauty is that that insight validates him being from God. It's so powerful that later in verse 39, when she runs back to town, she'll say, come meet a man who knows everything about me. Okay, that's a little bit of a stretch. <laughs> but in her mind, knowing her big secret was proof that he, he, he must know everything. Because that's the last thing I would want him to know. And he knew that. It was such a profound moment that she gives him credit for basically knowing God clearly would, to, would tell him anything he needs to know about my life. But here's the point I'm making is, in this encounter, the evidence that God is real and present is this experience of a special piece of knowledge. 
And I think this is so important for us in our increasingly post-Christian culture, our post-rational, post-modern culture, where it's no longer about rational arguments that convince people into the kingdom of God. It's not about proving the resurrection or, or giving the reliability of scripture. I mean, in, in a world where your truth is not my truth, you can argue all that stuff and someone will just go, okay, fine, I just, I don't believe that. And you're like, wait, how can you, <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have a truth problem in our culture today, Right? But the more powerful apologetic, the more powerful evidence is experience for this generation. And so you can argue all you want, and those arguments are valid and real, and they belong on the shelf, and we need to know them, and we need to trust them. They're important. But if you really want to connect with this generation, you lead with experience. You don't argue that God is real. You show them God is real. And this is part of why I think as the community of faith, we need to continue to reclaim and lean into these prophetic gifts to say, Lord, what, what would you reveal to me now about this person I'm speaking with that might let them know that you see them and you love them and you know them? Or what area of brokenness in their life could I pray for healing for that you would then give healing and they would know that you see them and love them? They would have a tangible experience that God is real and at work. That's much more powerful than any book you could hand them. Jesus is a prophet doing this exact same thing. And then the final ministry gift that's at play here is Jesus' teaching ministry is at work. The woman says, Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I the one speaking to you, I am he. Teachers are guides that impart understanding. They, they frame life in a, in a broader context that makes sense for people. They correct error and they lead people towards truth. And this woman maybe even naturally kind of redirects this conversation about her five failed marriages, which might be embarrassing, into more of an intellectual rabbit trail in the area of worship. And I love how Jesus doesn't go, whoa, 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 back to the five husbands. He's like, oh, you, you have some questions about worship? You need someone to explain worship to you? I sense maybe even that you don't fully understand it. Let me go into teacher mode. And Jesus breaks out like a four-point sermon on Worship 101 right here. I mean, like this, we, this could be next week you just, if we we're on worship. But he basically breaks down to her, worship must be grounded in spirit and truth. Worship's not about a location. It's not a where. It's a what. It's about who you're worshiping. God seeks after people who worship him. That's profound for her. God wants people like you who want to worship him. And then fourth, that the nature of worship will change when the Messiah comes. That there will be a radical reorientation around worship. And we know that ultimately because of the Holy Spirit's feeling that the Spirit will allow us to be able to worship and experience God, not just in one place, but any place. I mean, it's such a rich teaching text right there. But the goal of the teaching, the goal of the instruction, just like the goal of all teaching ministry, is to help the, the learner into a deeper loving relationship with Jesus. And that's what happens here. All of the scriptures point to Jesus. And this teaching passage, that he, this teaching moment that he had points to him. And she says, I'm looking for the Messiah. And he says, you found him. I'm right here. Sorry, final gift is the shepherd ministry gift at work. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Shepherds are reconcilers. They're, they're peacemakers. They're caregivers and healers. And here's a woman who just snuck out of town in the middle of the day to avoid being seen. The only reason she would even leave her home and risk embarrassment is because she needed water. And yet her encounter with Jesus is so profound that she leaves the jug of there and runs back without it. 
And she left town ostracized and marginalized and stigmatized. And now she comes back into town screaming and crying out and drawing everyone around her. Rather than trying to be on the out, have no one look at her, now she's like, hey, hey, everyone pay attention to me. I have something that you all need to hear. And all of a sudden, as people gather around her, she gets to be the one to proclaim. She gets to be the evangelist to proclaim that I've met the Messiah. I've, I've heard the good news. Come and meet him. And I always imagine, you know, for years and decades down the road that this woman will be the reason that this town in Samaria understands and becomes followers of the Messiah. That she goes from being the outcast to being the hero. But that's part of Jesus' shepherding ministry. She goes from having no friends to being surrounded by a community who's grateful that she's a part of it. That's what reconciliation looks like. In the presence of Jesus the shepherd, it doesn't just save her soul. It's not just that she's going to heaven when she dies. It restored her from a place of, of shame to a place of honor. And now she has the abundant life of being in a loving community that appreciates that she has something to add and she has a value to give. It's a great final picture of the end of the ministry as she comes full circle and receives this loving gift of being a part of a community. Jesus, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the shepherd and teacher, he becomes a gift to this woman and she'll never be the same. I want to close by doing something a, a little differently with our reflection time because I think in a series like this, it's easy to focus a lot on the how do we live this out part. And this is what the verb collaborate is all about, is how do we collaborate to be like this? But just to pause and recognize that we will never be like Jesus to the world in a way that we haven't experienced Jesus be to us. If you've never experienced Jesus as an evangelist who, is, who has won you to the good news, you can't go be an evangelist of the good news of Jesus to the world. If you've never experienced healing and wholeness through Jesus as shepherd, you, you don't have healing and wholeness to offer to the world. And so even today, as we kind of close, I want to just allow us to not just focus on how do we go be Jesus in the world, but how do we receive these five ministries of Jesus in our own life? These are the ways he wants to minister to us as well. And then eventually minister to us and then through us to the world around us. So as we learn to identify these gifts, I thought it'd be good to just close by creating some space of silence and, and asking Jesus to speak to us with just these five questions maybe. Where is Jesus the apostle leading me to take a risk in faith? In what areas is Jesus the prophet calling me to radical obedience to his word? How is Jesus the evangelist trying to draw me even closer to him? What wounds is Jesus the shepherd working to finally heal in me? And what truth is Jesus the teacher trying to get me to fully embrace? Let's ask the spirit to speak to us in these closing moments now that we might not just be participants in the ministry of Jesus, but first and foremost recipients of the ministry of Jesus.